everyone and making their concerns a part of it. So I, I think those two things are the reason that uh, people find that there is so much difference in what happens when women are at the table. It isn't just the issues. You know, will there be medical testing of, of drugs involving women or only men between the ages of uh, 40 and, and 50? Um, will, will we deal with jobs for women or, you know, so, but it is also the, the, just the way we go about it. Um, and that, that we come in later means that we very often don't have the big, um, I think it used to be called a Rolodex. It's on your computer now. But we don't have a big network like that, um, and we particularly don't have generally a big network of people like that who can write gigantic checks. So we win and we're successful uh, despite that, and I think part of it's because the public understands without analyzing it, just get a, on a gut level, uh, why it is valuable to have 51% uh, of the population represented in governance and voting when the decisions are made. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I'm going to jump because we have representatives of women in politics who aren't elected, but just to finish this little discussion of the three panelists who are in elected office, Mariko Yamada, I'm going to turn to you as a freshman assembly member just entering the game. And let's all remember that when politics as we know it today was invented, there were not a lot of women at the table, right? So um, are there rules of the game that you would like to change? And if so, what are they? Well, you know, I'm not sure that the rules of the game are necessarily gender specific. I think uh, the Women's Caucus in the legislature right now is the largest caucus. It is a bipartisan group. But I think uh, part of the rules of engagement that I would like to see uh, change uh, is um, additional focus upon uh, policy and expertise in certain subject areas as opposed to some of the other ways in which uh, assignments are made or uh, different legislation is carried. Um, you know, as a freshman, I uh, think that we can all say the last year was unlike any year that anyone has ever seen mm -hmm. in California. So I'm not sure that my perspective is, you know, it's probably tempered by the fact that last year uh, was uh, very, very unusual. I'm sure Speaker Bass can attest to the differences uh, in the uh, five and six years that she has served. I'm certainly hoping that this year will be uh, a little smoother, but we know that uh, in the environment in which we're working, uh, in which uh, one party, quite frankly, not represented here this evening, but I will look forward to coming to the next panel uh, to hear what my Republican counterparts might say, you know, when you have um, uh, a group that has already drawn a line in the sand and are just saying no uh, in a no new revenue environment, it's, it's very difficult to uh, have a conversation, whether you're a man or a woman. And I think it's that kind of um, intransigence and recalcitrance, uh, unwillingness to uh, cross the aisle and have an honest conversation about what it's really going to take to advance California's interests uh, and a commitment to the kinds of uh, systems in education and health care and employment that uh, I think most people in California want. So as far as, you know, the rules of the game uh, as, uh, as related to us as women, I think that is our charge and our responsibility uh, to make sure that we continue to try to, you know, to uh, collaborate and try to communicate and make those changes. Certainly, I know um, uh, Laura mentioned that uh, she and I are both social workers, so uh, our views of the world, uh, and you can tell she's going to be very egalitarian about the panels, <laughs> even, you know, that she noted several times already that, that she wanted to make sure that these panels were balanced. And it's that kind of thinking, the balanced thinking and the common sense thinking that I think women uh, and the uh, brave men that are joining us this evening, um, one of whom is, I must say, I just wanted to call out the fact that my husband, Jan Lee Wong, is here uh, tonight. And, uh, Let's applaud the brave men. He, 
But he's also a social worker, so see, I mean, you, you have to surround yourselves uh, with uh, people who are willing to, you know, advance a certain value system. And I think that's the kind of change that I'd like to see in our institution. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. You know, I'm, oh, Gail, there you are. Okay, so as one of the, the leading Democratic uh, campaign consultants in the state, you have serious passion for politics and political issues, and I'm curious to know, why haven't you run for public office, and why did you choose the, this path as a woman in politics instead? Um, everybody hear me okay? Uh, well, uh, I made a decision a long time ago after one attempt at running for ah. Central Committee in San Francisco, and I think there were like 40 people on the ballot, and I came in maybe 38th or so. <laughs> so I did actually get a, a slight taste of it before I started my business, but um, seriously, there aren't a lot of women who run political campaigns. Mm. Um, I'm one of the few. Um, I uh, made a decision early in the, along the way. I loved politics, I worked on campaigns, I worked in the legislature, um, and I thought that, there, that for me at least, I have an amazing respect for people who actually run, whether it's for school board or city council all the way up to the top offices. And I don't think people, I know, most voters don't really understand what that is all about. You put your life in a very public setting. Um, you are available to people. They ask you amazing <laughs> questions. They expect you to be experts on any number of subjects all the time. And I, I thought either that was gonna be the way I would go or I would rather be behind the scenes letting someone else do that and be very comfortable in the role that I now play, which is choreographing behind the scenes a lot of what happens. I still get to do policy on occasion. I still get to push candidates and uh, issues that I care deeply about. I'm terribly partisan in what I do, um, but I felt like um, for me, and I, and I always, hope that other people make that choice, that they don't actually go and run somebody else's campaign because they really want to be the candidate. Because I think they, they don't think about it from the candidate's perspective, they're always thinking about it from somebody, from their own perspective. So to be a good campaign manager, a good campaign consultant, I think you have to make the choice early. Mm. And I did. Um, for me, I just would say as a woman in this business, um, I've been called everything under the sun. I, I uh, got called tough very early as I started my business. And at first, I used to be very offended by that. And I kept thinking, why does everybody call me tough? Um, why, I'm a pussycat. <laughs> and then I decided that, um, You're a well, pussycat like me. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was code for any number of other words they chose not to use. <laughs> Uh, in mixed company or alone, and I heard most of those as well. And so I kind of wear it as a badge of honor, if that's what I get called, and that's the worst that I get called in public, that's fine by me, because this is a tough business, mm -hmm. and it is hard on your life and on the choices you make, and we're all talking about that. Politics is a, you know, is a, is a, Brutal sport, and to be in it, you have to understand that from the beginning. And I, I love it, but um, I respect it for what it is. And um, I think most women, when I started my business, I thought I would only run women candidates. I thought that sounded really neat. And if I had done that, I would have closed up shop pretty fast. A long fast. time ago. <laughs> um, and that's just a statement about the number of women and who think about it, who have these choices to make, and also some of the things we've talked about in terms of their ability to raise money mm. <laughs> and pay me. Maybe so. we'll, yeah. <laughs> Good what point, and maybe we'll get to come back to that whole issue about the challenges, uh, especially that women candidates face. Sure. 
Anamat de Santos as the youngest panel member, the youngest director of finance ever. So you've already seen California government from a variety of aspects, and I guess especially, um, and I'm honoring you because of your age, um, could you talk a little bit about you know, the road to success? Because you've hit a high place at an early age, and the audience is interested in our story. So to what do you credit this success? Um, so I was just talking to Elise earlier and I said, okay, how do I answer the question about being the young person? And Elise said, the only way you can talk about what it's like being you, which is right. The only thing I know really well um, mm. is what it feels like to be me. And I think when I think about the, the, my, um, you know, my opportunities in life and where I am in life, I, there's different things that I credit, but, but a chief among them is kind of how my grandmother and how my parents, um, particularly my mother, taught me to, um, to, to uh, confront things. And when I was a kid, whenever I'd say, well, I'm mad, or you know, I'm upset, my mother said, or my grandmother said, well, good, you got two problems. You got being mad or being upset or being scared, and whatever it was that got you into that place. So how about we skip the first stage and focus on the second one? Hmm. And, um, and I think, you know, I tried to, just take on challenges to be willing to work hard, to be willing to, to say, I don't know, and um, know who to call, um, and to do, to, the be to do the best I can in the opportunities that are presented to me. And sometimes things happen in very um, random ways. In some ways, I can see kind of how I've gotten to be where I am based on the fact that one of my colleagues ended up um, going into labor earlier and <laughs> had to go on maternity leave before there was a plan and I got handed one of her big bills. Um, <laughs> And, and that got me exposed into Medi-Cal and working with lots of people because there was no one else to take that bill file in the week that she was gone. And, um, and sometimes things happen like that. And I think it's the, you know, it's the grand my grandmother and my mother telling me, you know, just forget about being afraid and just do the best you can to take on the opportunity, work hard, and let people know when you need help. Fabulous, great advice for everybody. <laughs> Good advice for young and old, thank you. <laughs> Nothing to do with age, that. So Carolyn McIntyre, you have spent many years advocating for a variety of important issues in Sacramento in your current and your past role. Um, there are stereotypes out there about lobbyists and advocates, you know, uh, stereotypes about guys in suits uh, collecting money in envelopes. But I want to hear you know, your view of what is the role of a lobbyist in politics from your experience? Well, let me start by saying that the industry um, has changed a lot. And I should say the California political environment has changed a lot since I became um, involved in advocacy. I was involved in advocacy before there were term limits. So when I was, became involved in mm -hmm. advocacy, you had um, political institutions that were in place and had been in place uh, for years. You also had a lobby corps uh, that had also been in place for years and had long-standing relationships, which really did um, have a lot to do with how things got done. Um, term limits changed a lot of that, but having been here before, before term limits were put in place, I had an opportunity to work in that environment that had all of these traditions that I was now new to. And what I found is that you, you, you had to come in and you had to work harder and you had to be better. Uh, there were not a lot of women involved uh, in the lobby corps at, at that time because you didn't have the long-standing relationships that were there, you had to know what they were talking about uh, with regards to the policy, what their position was, what your position was, and then figure out how to somehow get into their environment with that member to make your point. And so it was a, a very different environment than it is now. What is the same, however, is that women still have to work harder. Mm. And you still have to understand both sides of the issue and you, it is a process by which you are continuously educating uh, policymakers, especially now when you look at one third of the legislature turning over every two years. It's a constant educational process. And so I made a commitment to myself that if I'm gonna be in this game, I'm gonna be in this game to win. 
And so, like Gail, I'm not exactly known for um, <laughs> having, having a very the kinder and gentler side. lobbyist. I'm not, the, I'm not exactly known for being kind and gentle. Um, but, um, you know, I've learned how to get things done. And I've learned how to survive in this environment. Great, great. And Ginger Rutland. So our panelists today represent a variety of roles working in politics. You are a, an editor, a journalist. You focus a lot of your work on politics. How do you see your role in politics as a journalist slash editor? And if you feel like it, throw in whether you think things have changed radically for women in politics during your career here. Um, yes, things have changed. When I started working at the Capitol, which is longer ago than I care to remember um, or tell to tell you, um, I re there was only I, I, I was there when the first woman went into the Senate. Her name was Roseanne Vuich. Wow. And and lovely lady, um, uh, I, a lovely lady. I really really liked her. I remember they had to build a a a, a ladies' room for her because there was none. There, there was nothing there for women in because there hadn't been no women in the Senate. There had been women in the Assembly, but most of the women came up by virtue of their husbands. Their husbands died and they took that seat. I hate term limits, but I gotta tell you, term limits have opened up opportunities for both minorities and for women in a big way in the legislature. The turnover has allowed women to come into, into the legislature uh, in, a, in a much faster way than they were in the past. Most of them have taken the seats of turned out old white guys. That's, 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 that's the fact. The sad part about it is, this, and I, believe me, I'm married to an old white guy, so I have a lot of affection for old white guys. And, I, and, I, and, and I've seen them be sensitive and smart, and I've seen them cry, so I don't wanna denigrate white mm -hmm. guys, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair, because I don't think women are all good, mm -hmm. and I don't think men are all bad. So I want to, I, I think it's important that we don't get into this gender, you know, baba thing, because, you know, there's yeah, some. we're not into male bashing. Yes, and, 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 and so I'm, I'm thinking that what, what, what distresses me about politics today, where women are being allowed to come to the forefront, is that you cannot have a female Willie Brown or a female David Roberti because of term limits. There's not going to be that kind of, of, mm. of institutional knowledge, smarts, and all of that stuff that's allowed to exist in the California legislature today because of term limits. So term limits have allowed women to come in in greater numbers, I think, but it has also prevented them from gaining the kind of institutional knowledge, the smarts, the experience, all of that kind of stuff that you need to inf affect real change. And I think that's too bad. And I think that as women, we ought to work on ending term limits. There you so. go. <laughs> yeah. So, where our speaker has to leave for another engagement. So. Our next congresswoman. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. <laughs> so you are all remarkably successful women. And one has to assume that there have been sacrifices along the way. Um, I, maybe I'll make you all comfortable in saying that as I made the decision to run for office, um, a long-term marriage ended because it was discordant with the status quo in the relationship that I had with my husband. So I would turn to you um, with the question to all of you and jump in, raise your hand, whatever. Have there been sacrifices, do you think, that you've made for your career? And are you willing to talk about them? And, okay, Gail. Um, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, the word is a difficult word because when I'm 
thinking about it, I'm thinking about my family. I was a single mother. I have an 18-year-old son who is in his last year in high school. And um, in order for me to take the path and open my business and do what I do, and politics is, you know, 24 hours a day, um, I think you have to make a lot of sacrifices. I think you have to balance this word we all try and use, mm. a lot of things together. I'm sure if you ask him, um, he might answer the question and, you know, if, if, if you asked him, was it worth it? I don't know what he would say. Um, but I certainly know that I sacrificed in my own mind the time I would have had with him that I didn't in order to have this success and, and do what I do. I also think, and it's a different question in a way, women of my age came up at a time when not everybody had the opportunity or even would have considered opening their own business. And that was really scary to me. So taking that leap, seeing if I could make it, do all that stuff was important to me as a person. I'd like to think it made me a good mother as well, but I don't know. Thank you. Anybody else?